All right, YouTube. Today we're taking a look at a ball which is connected by two strings to a rod, and the ball is spinning or swinging around that rod in a horizontal circle. And what I want to do today is go through and show you how to solve for the tension in the two strings which are connecting the ball to the rod. Now I've written out this problem so that it looks like a problem you might see in something like a textbook, uh, but I'll go through and I'll work the problem in variables rather than the numbers that are given to us in the problem so that you can use this solution to solve whatever problem it is that you're working on. Now the whole idea in this problem is that these two strings are acting on the ball, one acting up this way and the other downward at a diagonal. And when put together, those two strings are providing some centripetal force on the ball which is causing it to go in a circle. Really what I'm getting at is that the solution to this problem is entrenched in Newton's second law and centripetal force. You see, to solve this problem, what we're going to need to do is look at both the top and the bottom string as variables, or unknowns. And since we have two unknowns in this problem, we're going to need to look at both the x and the y axis motion of this ball in order to solve for the two tensions in the strings. Now, in order to do that, I want to take a look at the free body diagram of the ball as it's rotating around this rod. You see, this first string, we'll call this string one, is pulling on this ball up and to the left on the ball when the ball is positioned right here. So I'm going to say that force by the string is T1. And then this other string down here, we'll call that string two, has some tension T2. And that tension is down and to the left. Remember, a string can only ever act along its axis. Now our third and possibly the most important force in this problem is gravity, which is acting straight down on the ball. So we'll just say that force is the weight of the ball, or mg. Now the most important thing to recognize in this entire problem is that these two tensions in the strings are acting in both the vertical and horizontal axes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those two force vectors and break them up into their vertical and horizontal components. We'll call them T1y and T1x, and T2y and T2x. And so at first it looks like we're creating more unknowns, but as we work through this, we'll find this all boils down and allows us to solve for T1 and T2. You see, if we look at the y-axis first, the sum of all forces in the y-axis needs to equal zero. That is to say the ball is not going to accelerate vertically. It's only going in a horizontal circle. Now vertically, we have three different forces or components of forces. We have the vertical component of T1, the vertical component of T2, and gravity downward. So putting those together, we've got T1 upward. I'm going to say that's the positive direction, minus T2y downward. So I'm going to say that's in the negative direction. And then of course we have gravity downward. So we're going to have minus mg. And the sum of those three forces adds up to zero. Again, the ball isn't accelerating vertically. Now, like I said, we interjected or made up these variables of T1y and T1x, or really these components of tensions. I want to get rid of those and relate them back to T1 the actual force we're trying to solve for. Now, if you look at this as a right triangle, all we have is an opposite and adjacent side. So T1y is actually T1 sine theta, and T2y is just T2 sine theta. And this leaves us with a single equation, but there's two unknowns within that equation. And that's the whole idea behind this problem. Looking at a single axis, the y-axis, doesn't get us a solution. Because we have multiple unknowns, we have to look at multiple axes. So turning next to the horizontal axis, we're again going to apply the second law, or f equals ma. Now this time around, we've got t1 acting inward toward the center of the circle, and t2 is also acting inward toward the center of the circle, which is a bit different from the y-axis. Vertically, the two tensions were fighting each other, but horizontally, they're working together. Now you'll notice there's absolutely nothing pulling on this ball to the right. It's just two forces to the left. And that is to say, there's a net force on the ball. It's that net force that's causing the ball to accelerate centripetally. So looking at the x-axis, we can say the sum of all forces in the x-axis is going to cause the ball to experience some centripetal acceleration. I'm going to call that MAC. AC for centripetal acceleration. 
Now, our two forces that are acting horizontally on this ball are T1x and T2x. So setting T1x plus T2x equal to MAC, we can expand out those T1 and T2x terms just like we did with our y terms up here. We can express T1x or show T1x as T1 cosine theta. And T2, of course, is going to be T2 cosine theta. And we're going to set those equal to our mass times the centripetal acceleration, that is V squared over R, which are given to us in the problem. Now, there's one thing to point out here. I'm running through this as though these angles are just theta. And I modeled this as though the two angles are the same. But if you're working a problem where the two string angles are different, that's okay. You just have to keep your two different thetas separate from one another. But realize, at this point, we've done all the physics for the whole problem. All that's left now is just some math. That is, solving a system of equations and plugging in some numbers. So moving this stuff over here, we're going to rearrange this first equation for T1 and then sub it in down here. What that does is it leaves us with an equation for T2. Now plugging in the mass, radius, velocity, and angle into this equation, we can solve for T2. And we find this is 23.2 newtons. And turning around and subbing that back in up here for our equation in the y-axis, really over here, we find that T1 is 78.6 newtons. Now truly, be careful as you work through all this algebra. I find a lot of times people will drop negatives or make small mistakes in this, which causes them to get the problem wrong. But don't worry, there's a way to check this problem. You see, once we've determined the tension in these two strings, there's a way to go back through and look at what's going on here so that we're sure our solution is correct. You see, knowing the magnitude of these two tensions, if we combine the horizontal components of each of those two tensions, we find that there's 72 newtons of force acting centripetally on this ball. Now, if our two tensions that we calculated are correct, those two tensions then should actually should equal the total centripetal force on the ball, centripetal force being mv squared over r. And if you plug in the numbers from the problem, you see we in fact get the centripetal force is 72 newtons. Our horizontal components equal the centripetal force. That's really what we came up with in the x-axis earlier. So ultimately, this problem checks out. Another little interesting quirk about this problem is that if you work out the problem and you find that you get a negative result for this tension 2 right here, it doesn't necessarily mean that you did something wrong in your calculations. What it means is that this string right here actually has to be pushing on the ball upward and to the right in order to keep the ball suspended at this position here. Now, of course, that wouldn't work with a string because a string can only pull, but it might be a situation where we had to replace this lower string with a rod. So this has been how to solve this problem of a ball spinning around a rod. I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.